My name's Howard Wimshurst. We're going to be looking at how to create atmosphere in animation. For this video, I thought I'd include something special. So I decided to make my Atmosphere PNG pack available for you to download. For a while now, I've been creating my own custom textured atmospheres in Photoshop. This has been my most effective strategy to building Atmosphere, a pack available for you to download with this video. Experimenting with the different atmospheres in this pack they're super easy to use, you just you drag and drop them into your animation software. This includes Flash, TV Paint, Clip Studio, Photoshop, After Effects, you name it. And put it in a layer and it works wonders. It, it transforms the scene very quickly. I recorded a 30 minute video demonstration to go with it so that you'll be able to learn how I use them and easily create atmospheric depth for yourself. And just from the the demo alone, you'll be able to see how it can transform your environments to have a lot more depth and be a lot more visually interesting. So the link to the download will be made available in the description and I hope you check it out after watching this. Now onto the main video. Talking about atmosphere, we could be talking about two different things. We could be talking about visual atmosphere or we could be talking about ambience atmosphere. This is a distinction that I've made because I know that in filmmaking there does exist this difference. In a nutshell, visual atmosphere is going to be uh, literally creating a sort of atmosphere within your scene and how you can do it, the different ways you can do it. Ambience atmosphere is more of a directing approach, style of your animation and how it can create a, a style and, and a mood for your audience. Uh, which is different. So I just wanted to get that distinction out of the way. Uh, it's something that I'm very interested in right now, but we're gonna start with uh, visual atmosphere. When we look around, we are seeing through air. This is just, I'm covering the basics here. Uh, it's actually a combination of different gases, particles in the air as well. And we often think of air as being clear, but actually it's not completely clear. And this is proven when we look into the distance. So when we look into the distance, that was a terrible arrow. <laughs> when we look into the distance, things change visually, uh, not just with the colors, but in a variety of different ways. That is what I call atmospheric distortion. So the atmosphere distorts what you're able to see. And depending on the difference, that atmospheric distortion is stronger or weaker. The further away something is, the more air the, the, the light has to go through. So yeah, or you could call it obscurity, but I prefer atmospheric distortion. In each slide here, I've just added in a picture that I think demonstrates an aspect of atmospheric distortion quite well, or at atmosphere in general. Uh, so this is from House of Flying Daggers. It's a brilliant film, really visually. It's one of my favorite films, I'd say. Ladies stepping out of the forest. The atmospheric distortion separates those three from the others. So you're seeing there how it can be used stylistically. Going into more detail, atmospheric distortion, what it's characterized by. So these are the ones that I could think of. There might be more. Reduced contrast is one of them. Here, I've also put an actual graph of what contrast can look like. So this is just grabbed from one of my uh, concept art pieces that I did recently. And this shows the light spectrum from light to dark. So you can see how much of it is occupying like the mid range around the gray area. And this is just light and dark, this isn't hues. Um, and then how much of it is occupying the whites. Uh, this part here is where it's like almost white basically. And this one is where it's basically black. So each image, it kind of has one of these. Now, if you imagine back in this picture, if you had an image that was just this character, right? and just this character. So the one that's in the foreground would have, if you look, if you were to look on the graph, the one in the foreground would have it much more spread out, this kind of um, spectrum. And then the one in the background would probably have it squashed in here. It might be 
further to the left. If it's daytime, it's probably gonna be a bit brighter. Depending on the environment, it could also be pushed darker. So that's my kind of way of seeing it. Now when I'm painting, I'm seeing this graph all the time. I'm thinking of that principle of uh, contrast. Uh, because you can use that as well to actually dictate what the character, what the audience notices in your scene. Right, anyway, moving on, change, change in brightness, I've also kind of touched that already. So uh, maybe the foreground color is a bit lighter or a bit darker. You know, if you have a close light source, the foreground element is gonna be much brighter. And then anything further away from that light source is gonna get darker and darker. You can use brightness as well to kind of separate layers. That's one thing I do in my concept art that I've probably covered before. Uh, fine particles. So sometimes the atmosphere actually has really fine particles in it, like little bits of dust, maybe snow could count, or rain, uh, any precipitation could count. Um, but I usually think of it as like dust or smoke, that's uh, dust that's been picked up from the floor or things, that can count as atmosphere, especially if it's just kind of suspended in the air. Treat it as a layer of atmosphere. I really like to do that, actually. The coloration. Coloration elements with, that are far in the background are given a tint. And I'll actually show you how to do that in a little while. And when you start doing this, when you start giving them that tint, it, uh, it really does transform the image and makes it much better. Because of our Earth's atmosphere and the water in the atmosphere, there's usually a blue tint to everything that's outside during the daytime, but it can have uh, orange or red. Slight loss of detail as well. Especially in 2D hand-drawn animation, I would really uh, make sure this is a thing. It's very easy to do this effect, to lose detail in the background. So all you do is uh, when you're drawing or painting the, the image and the things in the background, you don't zoom in. <laughs> Sometimes I see people zoom in really and do all the details of something in the background. Often it doesn't look better to do that and all of that detail is a bit of a waste of time and it can actually look better if you, um, if you detail things in the foreground and leave the detail in the background, just get by with minimal uh, levels of detail. You can actually just block in people very easily and other objects. This was just a, a little note that Sometimes if you shine a light beam or something or like a laser beam, high powered lasers, when you shine them, the light is actually just sort of traveling through. But the reason why you can see the beam itself is because it's bouncing off of particles in the atmosphere. And that's a similar thing for light shafts from the sun and, and from lights. Um, they're actually bouncing off of little particles of dust and things in the atmosphere and that's why you can see the actual shaft itself. You can do some amazing things with that as well. Screenshot from Finding Nemo, because I really love this composition they did in there. Uh, not only for just the, the fact that it draws attention to the massive open abyss, but also I think it was a, quite a good um, demonstration of atmospheric depth and in this case it's not air that we're seeing through it's water so you can see a few differences there like the sunlight it can only go down so far from the surface and then it starts to not be able to penetrate the, the deep water kind of different in in water it it's, behaves a bit differently um, and you can see here they've got some blur on this now Blur doesn't really count as atmospheric depth, that's more to do with the, the lens of the camera, I think, so um, I wouldn't put that in the same category, but you can see that there's less detail on it, that it's got a tint, it's got a bl blue-green tint, um, and that there's reduced contrast. You see there's way fewer colours in there, it's, a, it's just a simple, almost like a block colour for that second part because it's further away. Atmospheric distortion, it can be used to obscure what we see um, and that creates mystery, it creates interest because we're always interested in things that we can't exactly see or understand or know. Aesthetically, it can also harmonize all of the colors because of that concept of ambient light, the light bouncing around everywhere, it colors everything within a similar part of the spectrum. This picture here, I can't remember what film, I think it's, I think it's from a James Bond film. Uh, the cinematographer is Roger Deakins, who's one of my favorite cinematographers. And if you look at the local color, you can see that that character 
is dark, but he's not black. He's actually um, like this orange color. He's just darker than the stuff around it. And here I really like how uh, this fire is illuminating the atmosphere around it and we're getting this kind of textured mist in here and it's it's really nice to see. Um, and it's also reflecting off of the water and just creating a very interesting, uh, rich image. I also like how the uh, we can see this smooth gradient that moves through yellow, orange and red. Uh, and that's also created by the atmosphere. So it it's really is a creative tool to create atmosphere. Also, if, if you're an animator like me, maybe you have to um, draw some animation on top of an environment, like a, an environment painting that you might have done or someone else might have painted it. And sometimes if you've got like a character palette from your character design sheet, I often find this, there's often like a character design sheet and the character is stood on a white background and you see the character color. You are drawing it into this environment and it doesn't look right. The colors don't work. It looks as if the character has just been dropped there on top. It doesn't look like it's actually part of the scene, like the character is actually standing there in the scene. Now the reason for that is because you don't have any um, local color, you haven't put any layers of atmosphere in between the character and the camera, and the colors are just from the white background. The colors should be adapted to whatever environment the character is in. If you give that character a tint, and you adjust the brightness to where it should be, then the character is going to instantly feel like it belongs in that scene, like he is in that scene and you haven't just drawn him on top of the background painting. Okay, um, so here's where I'm going to go into techniques and examples. Um, I'm going to open up a few of my old files go through them and just show you how I'm actually doing this because up until now it's been quite abstract. This is from Pirates of the Caribbean and I just really liked this scene. I love the set design and I love how they used steam because it's in a, a kind of bathhouse steam room. Um, and that, you can see here that this column of, of this shaft of natural light that's come down from the top from some kind of uh, vent in the top that has separated the main character from the background and really made him pop out. Very cool. You've got the glow down here as well and having light on the bottom can look really uh, interesting and mysterious and stuff. Um, so yeah, really like that composition and set design. I was very impressed with that when I saw it. Anyway, alpha reduction is a very cheap trick. And for this, I'm using uh, Adobe Flash. So even though I'm not using uh, bitmap and raster, you can still achieve these atmospheric distortion looks. But I'm starting with the easiest one. It's probably the worst one to use as well. Okay, so this is from a commission I did a long time ago called Meet the Sky. And this is a scene that I animated from it. You might have seen it in my showreel. And so I'm gonna double click into this and just have a look at the rock formations that I had. For each one, because they are standalone uh, sort of floating islands, I figured that they'd be at different distances from the camera. So I gave them slightly different alphas. I would have drawn this, I take each of these and I just go into color effect, alpha, and then for the alpha I just bring it down a little bit. This is what it looked like without alpha something doesn't look right there. And it's because that hasn't had the atmospheric distortion that it should have. And alpha just means transparency. We just knock the transparency back a little bit to 66% in this case. The object will now take on the color of the background uh, of the sky in this case. If you have things moving across, this method isn't very good. But that's the method that I used for this shot. And you can see here from the for the environment. All those rocks, they, they don't call too much attention to themselves, even though they're very sharp. Um, and that's because they have uh, alpha reduction on. Tint is just like alpha, 
reduction, instead of reducing the alpha, you take something, let's say I wanted to push this tower. I didn't want to push this tower into the background because it's the main focus and I wanted to show that and give it as much contrast as I could. But if I wanted to push this tower into the background, all I have to do is go down to style again in the color effect, go to tint and I drop this uh, color to be the sky and it could be the blue color or it could be this orange down here I think I'll have it kind of gray blue and then increase the tint and look at that it looks like it's there's now atmosphere between us and the tower therefore it looks further away it looks in the distance uh, once I realized that that method was better I started using that a lot of what compositors do is this kind of thing where they get everything to look like it's part of the same thing so they'll take a photograph that they have a like a high-res photograph but it was in different lighting conditions and they need to paste it into their scene so they mess about with the colors like this to get it to really feel like it's part of the scene it's great for creating atmospheric distortion the tint can also adjust at the same time the brightness and the contrast. It will automatically reduce the contrast of your object and it will change the brightness. So if you choose a bright color, it will make the object brighter. If you choose a dark color, it will make the object darker. So uh, it's a very good method really. The next one is alpha gradients, this one here. Now I used alpha gradients all the time in uh, meet the sky as well um, I'm also going to show it in one of my films that I haven't yet released actually called dance of the yokai and in this shot we see that she's kind of I use uh, the radial gradients all the time in my animations if I'm not using them in like the animation software like flash or TV paint then I'll use them in um, uh, after effects with like masking layers so in on this layer here now we've gone into the file I've created this gradient so I'll show you from the beginning how to make one of these yourself we just go to the rectangle tool drag across to whatever size we want then we select it go to color and with color there's a drop down here solid color linear color uh, we'll go to radial gradient for this now you can make it any color you want you can edit it like this now in here we uh, select one of these nodes and the a is alpha that's for transparency bring that to zero drag that down to zero and then you can change the color still to anything you want so now we have just this patch with a nice even distribution and that behaves a lot like how light behaves you know when light is emitted and falls on the surface from there you can also add extra nodes in at different places so here I'm gonna create a sort of ring a ring like characteristic like that so there's lots you can play with here you can then distort it like this um, you can also change the base to be like down here. So just using those and layering them, I was able to create some cool effects. In this one, I just created this uh, glow, which is this sort of orange gradient and made it a very soft patch. Then I put that into a movie clip symbol and I actually moved it about to mimic where this light source was coming from so this was like how it affected the ground and I know this isn't exactly atmosphere but it's just a demonstration of what you can do with it you can animate them you can move them so it's very flexible um, along with that with the individual ones how I created that emitter was just a simple glow on the the symbols again so um, those were movie clip symbols and then you give it a glow so very simple and that's how I used to do it back in the days of Flash and nowadays I use uh, After Effects more. But all of these things you can do in compositing software as well. This background is actually made up of uh, an alpha gradient on top of it. So if I turn that off here, you can see that I've started with a simple, the linear gradient goes up like 
that. But then on top of that layer, I also created a very faint alpha gradient there. So you can see how I can manipulate that. And I've just put it as a sort of vignette around the outside of this um, frame. So you can use it to create to actually build up very complex gradients where it's not just a linear one and it's not just a radial, it's actually a combination of both. So that's just a, an extra tip for creating cool coloured backgrounds. That, that was a pretty short example for that one. You can actually do a lot more with it, but for now I'm going to have to move on. But you should definitely look into doing alpha gradients and layering gradients upon gradients if you're working in vector software it will really help you so now we're doing mist layers now this is the only one that i always use photoshop for this because i like the selection of different uh, textured brushes that i have in photoshop and so it's in that software that i create these mist layers and i'm going to show you them in a bit i'm going to cut away to me um, making those mist layers for you i then will just have them as a PNG without any uh, uh, transparency and I drag them into to flash have them on their own separate layer and then you can sort of animate them you can tween them or you can just keep them still and they they come with their own texture you see because you use a, a, a brush with them so you can see here how I've done this there's this scene where this character is sitting down to a nice dinner, a nice meal, and to create more of a, you know, a nicer atmosphere. I made these PNG layers with uh, steam basically rising off, and I just did a very simple tween of them rising. And actually to mimic the steam a little bit more, I had them stretch out a little bit because I noticed that steam can sometimes do that. It can sometimes appear like it's stretching out. This is stylized. It's not real life, but that's just an example of how I've done it here. And yes, light shaft masks. So I'll just demonstrate that here because we've already got a dark background. So right now we've just got a very simple gradient on this. I could do something like this. So take a rectangle and just make little shapes like this. Uh, skew them like that. Something like that, some kind of light shaft shape. So now I'm gonna get on the layer behind it and I'm just gonna make these little dots. Duplicate them around by holding Alt. Make those all of those little particles into a movie clip symbol. Now go back to your layer, which is going to be a mask layer. So remember what I said about shafts of light, and they basically the only reason you see them is that they pick up little particles in the air. We're going to make that into a movie clip symbol as well, those shafts. I'm just going to click mask. And so that masks in the layer below, which is this one. Now comes the fun part. Make a bunch of frames to give it time. And we will keyframe these particles here. I actually haven't done enough of them. I'm just going to add more on this side. There. So now we just tween them. So we've got this layer below, F6, move it to the sides. Move it any way you want, really. I assume it would be moving down a little bit and the wind was probably carrying it. Give that a motion tween. And you see that the dust moves through the light beams. Now we can also have it pick up some of the finer mist by just illuminating it. So here I'm gonna duplicate that mask layer, but untoggle the mask itself, break it apart, lower the opacity, the, the alpha, and now we also have it like that. So you can also see the beams quite precisely. But that's a really cool um, little effect that I developed a while ago. 
Um, I've done the particles quite large, you'd actually probably want them a lot finer. And also you can use the textured mist with this as well. It would actually look better if you uh, had, you can have the little particles and, and do them in any way you like. But having a textured mist as one of the masked things that's moving through would look really nice and so that the beams pick up that nice texture as it moves through. Really nice effect, so there you go, that's one thing you can use for atmosphere. Make it in any way you want really, it's very, it's very versatile. So those are a few techniques and examples that uh, I've shown, that I've, that I've done in different pieces of work, but I use these methods all the time and everything and I want to show that you can do it quite simply. I also created this pack for you, textured mist layers and they're really simple they've already got the png uh, alpha opacity so you all you have to do is just once you've downloaded it you have them in a folder and you can just drag and drop them into flash tv paint photoshop any software that you're using it will accept all of them and they're nice and big so that you have you have extra room to move them around, just like I did in that last one. It's gonna look great in any of these shafts of light or just to give it that extra texture and richness. Um, I used some of my favorite brushes and I tweaked about with these, uh, with these PNG layers for a long time so that they look really good. And these are exactly the kind of PNG layers that I actually use in my animations. So. Uh, it's there for you to download on my Gumroad page for you to download. It's also available at animatedguilds.com. So just click the link in the description, head over there, download it. There are loads of different films that I could give as examples for visual atmosphere. I think there are so many films that can do it really well. But one in particular that comes to mind that I watched fairly recently is Apocalypse Now. So I just feel like the use of smoke and atmospheric distortion in this film are really, really good. Um, and it's just a very good example of how you can use these uh, atmospheric distortion, smoke and dust effects to uh, create a mood and an aesthetic. Um, in this film, it makes it like it's the pits of hell. Like Vietnam is like this transformed hellish wasteland uh, and they're always using these smoke machines and smoke grenades and stuff to create these multi-layered environments that are just so visually interesting it really makes it feel like a different world and you would never want to witness like in a lot of shots the wind carries the smoke and that creates this really dynamic shifting landscape that i love so um, it's worth watching. It's a long film, but if you haven't watched it already, it's a classic if you want to learn more about visual atmosphere. Okay, and the last point is to experiment. So find your own ways to convey atmospheric distortion. Uh, this could be uh, finding different brushes to use, um, looking at old artwork, like here I pulled up a sort of uh, an oriental style painting. Uh, there's some really interesting things going on with watercolor that you can use, oil, acrylic. Look at how they use them and how you can distort things in that way and make it your own. Just do find your own ways of doing it and uh, that's one way that you develop your style. Yeah, it doesn't need to be realistic. You can figure out stuff that, that's like not realistic that works really well. Okay, if you liked this video and you'd like to learn more about how to create animations, the arts of animation, consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, new videos get made regularly. And thank you to my Patreon supporters. And yeah, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.